Okay, we'll get started because we've got a few slides to get through before we uh, move into Alison's talk. So my name is Kate Robertson. I'm the President-Elect of the Australian Society for Exploration Geophysicists. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank our corporate members, our Corporate Plus members, High Size, Total Seismic and Vel Size, and our corporate members, Southern Geoscience Consultants and Santos. So our corporate members make a financial contribution to the ASCG, which uh, also goes towards the ASCG Research Foundation. So it helps us to um, be able to provide uh, you know, events, uh, conferences, publications, um, but also the Research Foundation goes towards supporting geophysics students in uh, honours, masters and PhD. So we really appreciate their support. Jump onto our website if you want more information about becoming a corporate member. I'd also like to thank our branch sponsors and these, these uh, contributions usually go towards uh, our state branch events, which at the moment are all through webinars, um, but they're greatly appreciated. And again, you can jump onto the website for more information. Uh, after Alison's talk today, we will be having a Q&A session with Alison. So if you have any questions that pop up during her talk, uh, you can type in the chat box or the Q&A box what these questions are and we'll get to them all at the end. Um, alternatively, if you want to wait till the end, you can use the raise hand function and I will get to you then. We have a couple more webinars scheduled in the near future. So on the 16th of September, we have Rod Patterson, who will be talking about the application of two and a half D AEM inversion to resource exploration with reference to open file survey examples from New South Wales, Queensland and WA. And Thursday, 1st of October, Ankita Singh on grayscale representative elementary volumes, an innovative approach to investigative poor scale REVs from raw micro CT images. And if you're interested in giving a webinar, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we, we're always looking for new talk topics. Uh, I just also wanted to mention the benefits of being an ASCG member. So uh, an ASCG member gets free access to Exploration Geophysics, which is a technical journal um, that publishes high quality research and relevant uh, geophysical case studies. Uh, you also get free copies of preview at um, my monthly magazine, uh, reduced entry to AEGC conferences. Uh, next one is next year. Um, free or reduced entry to regular uh, technical events uh, in your local state branches um, and advertisement access to job advertisements. Um, so there's a lot of different benefits, um, but I guess overall mostly um, there's a huge benefit from being a member of a professional society and having the networking opportunities and making those connections um, that become available to you. So I highly recommend it. Um, and we do like to support students as well. So um, as I mentioned with the ASCG Research Foundation, um, but also we, um, a lot of the state branches as well have uh, travel grants for students or scholarships. And it is free as well to join up if you are a student or half price for retirees or recent graduates. Um, I mentioned the AEGC already, the Australasian Exploration Geoscience Conference. So our next one is being held in Brisbane next year. Uh, it's the 15th to the 20th of September and short abstract submission is now open with a deadline of the 30th of October. So jump onto the website which is in the bottom right hand corner there um, and we'll post the link in the chat as well um, and get your abstract submission in. And you can stay in touch with us through a range of different social media. We're very active on there and keep you up to date with uh, events, uh, geophysical stories, um, updates of uh, latest articles being written in preview, um, expression geophysics, uh, lots of different things on there. So jump on and also almost all of our webinars are available on YouTube um, after the talk. Um, and this one will be within the next few days as well. So uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. So with that, I will uh, stop sh uh, sharing my screen and um, introduce our speaker. So we have today uh, Dr. Alison Kirkby. Uh, so Alison joined Geoscience Australia in 2008 as a graduate. She then worked in geothermal studies for several years. 
uh, before. Sorry. <laughs> She then worked in geothermal studies for several years before completing a PhD in geophysics at the University of Adelaide under GA's study assistance program. Since completing her PhD, she has worked in the mineral systems branch of GA, where she's applying the magnetotelluric method to help to improve our understanding of Australia's lithospheric architecture and mineral potential. So Alison will be speaking about Oslamp in the Tasmanites, lithospheric architecture and mineral potential from magnetotellurics. So, um, Welcome, Alison, and uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, some work that I've been involved in over the last few years, uh, looking at OSLAMP data um, in southeastern Australia, so um, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, and so I'll be showing you some resistivity models um, that we've come up with. Um, and some of the implications for the lithospheric architecture and mineral potential. Um, and this work is, uh, this is, um, this work's been a collaborative effort. Um, there's been a lot of people involved with um, providing different ideas and, and con contribution to the data collection. Um, and I've acknowledged some of the people on, on, on the bottom here, um, but I just wanna mention that there's been a lot of people involved in this program that have contributed to it. Um, okay, so what I thought I'd open with is, um, is a slide that many of you are probably quite familiar with, um, but it provided uh, the impetus, I guess, for the OSLAMP program. Um, and it also gives us a context of what we're, tr what we're trying to aim for with, um, with OSLAMP. Um, so in the mid 2000s, um, Graham and others found that there was a um, conductive lower crust beneath the Olympic Dam. Um, IOCG deposit in South Australia uh, and subsequent infill, infill work found that there were um, a, a few, several conductive pathways um, leading up from this lower crustal conductor to the position of mineral deposits on the surface. Um, and so I guess what we're trying to image um, with OSLAMP is um, some more of these lower crustal conductors. So finding these um, broad scale regions uh, for future infill. Um, but also um, I guess also what we're trying to find out with OSLAMP, um, and I hope that you'll sort of appreciate this a bit more by the end of my talk, um, is what do these conductors mean um, for the lithospheric architecture and, and for how um, the Australian continent um, came together, this tectonic evolution. Um, so MT um, is kind of a perfect, um, a perfect technique for this. Um, it can image uh, the very upper crust to the base of the lithosphere. And the different types of MT that you see, um, that you hear about, essentially differ in um, recording time and sampling rate. So whereas um, audio MT um, is targeted in the upper kilometers of the crust, um, the, and, and you may only record for a couple of hours, um, the long period MT data um, is targeted at imaging um, down to the, the base of the crust and into the lithosphere um, and, and you're recording for more like um, weeks to months. And so as I mentioned, um, we, we're wanting to image crustal architecture um, leading to hopefully finding some more areas, um, areas of mineral deposits, but also to understand the tectonic development of, um, of the lithosphere. And so I included this slide to kind of give you a sense for, um, I guess, what, um, where we're at now and what we're going to. Um, so a first attempt at a national conductivity map was, um, was put together by um, some of our colleagues, um, Lee Jun Wang and others at GA. Um, and they used magnetic observatory stations to um, estimate the conductivity structure across Australia. Key things to note, I guess, is that um, there were only 57 sites across Australia, so it's a low res resolution view of um, the continent, but also um, it's magnetic field only, so the MT will give us the electric field component as well. And so you can see with this um, location, the station locations map, um, that um, we're gonna get uh, quite a significant increase in resolution from OSLAMP. Um, so 
uh, is the um, Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetotelluric Program. Um, and it started in late 2013, um, and it's a collaborative project between uh, universities um, and state surveys and GA. And between us, we've completed uh, 12, around 1,200 of 3,000 sites every half a degree of latitude and longitude. And GA's contribution um, has been across most of the programs. So we've um, provided um, logistical support and funding to, to, to most of the state programs, um, but we've led um, a program in Northern Australia under Exploring for the Future. Um, and New South Wales and Victoria, um, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, um, in collaboration with each of those state surveys. Okay, so before I go into southeastern Australia, I'll give you a quick overview of the MT method. Um, so we measure time variations in the Earth's electric and magnetic fields, um, and the um, the the signal um, is generated by um, different sources depending on um, what frequencies we're looking at. So the short period signal or the high frequency signal is generated by um, thunderstorms and, and lightning, um, whereas at longer periods, um, the signal was dominated um, by the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's um, magnetic field. Um, and so when we measure these um, variations in, in the electric and magnetic fields, we can use that to derive um, the Earth's electrical conductivity structure or its inverse resistivity. Um, so the, the, the field layout looks a bit like this. Um, so I've got um, a diagram showing um, the electric dipoles, which are um, typically oriented north-south and then east-west and measuring the horizontal electric field components. And the magnetic field can be recorded by uh, coils, so a horizontal, two horizontal coils and a vertical one. Or in the case of Auslamp, we've been using uh, flux gate magnetometers. Um, so that's just a single unit that's buried below the surface. Um, and so that's all laid out and then left for weeks to um, a month or two um, to record. So moving into southeastern Australia, um, and I thought I'd introduce southeast Australia by um, looking at um, uh, specifically about um, some of the tech, uh, some of the geophysical data uh, that existed before we came along with Auslamp. Um, and so the area that we're looking at is in the Tasmanides. Uh, so that's uh, the Tasmanides are five made up of five origins that make up the eastern third of Australia. Um, and the starter set is concentrated in the um, Lachlan origin um, and imaging sort of most of the Lachlan origin and um, some of the Eastern Delamarian origin. And so um, I'm going to show you some of the potential field data. So we've got the Bouguer gravity in it, um, anomaly map, um, which is um, compiled by GA. Um, this is upward continued to 2.4 kilometers. Um, and one of the things I guess that jumps out straight away is that we've got this kind of concentric geometry and centered in southern New South Wales. Um, the other data set that you can uh, look at is the isostatic gravity anomaly map. Um, so the Bouguer gravity is, um, is I guess, the, the um, contribution of density variations, but it's also got a contribution from um, changes in lithospheric thickness. Um, and the lithospheric thickness across this area of Australia actually varies quite significantly um, from around 200 to 80 kilometers thick. So um, the isostatic gravity is um, kind of gives you a bit more of the density variation component. Um, and I'll show you that a bit later with the MT data. Um, another one of the data sets that we can look at is the magnetic map. Um, and lots of really high frequency signal in the, in the magnetic map, but you can also see the, a similar pattern to what we saw in the um, gravity map, so um, the circular geometry. Um, another thing we can look at is the tilt filter, which um, was done by um, Bob Mus Musgrave um, quite a few, a few years ago. Um, and that, um, that really brings out this sort of concentric geometry um, that we see um, in the upper crust. Um, and so what that actually, the, what these geophysical images did is they sort of um, triggered a, 
a bit of a rethink about the tectonics of the area. So prior to that, it was really, um, the ideas were largely around kind of linear subduction zones, um, I guess the east, against the eastern margin of Australia. Um, but the geophysical data sort of triggered um, to everyone to think in 3D. So um, Ross Cayley um, in particular sort of um, came up with this idea that um, the the eastern um, part of Australia was um, formed by the um, collision of a microcontinent into the proto-eastern Australian margin. And that resulted in um, the Ordovician arcs being wrapped around uh, the microcontinent, resulting in the geometries that, that we see and um, explaining uh, a lot of the other geological data as well. And so I guess the next um, next thing is, well, can we see any evidence of these structures and some of the other geophysics or some of the deeper geophysical methods? Um, and so um, there's been a bunch of passive seismic work done across um, southeastern Australia. Um, and this, this one um, is looking at, uh, looked at Rayleigh wave phase anisotropy. And um, you can see there is some evidence for that, um, these curved structure in that data. Um, but these, these kind of data sets um, are really imaging um, the sort of upper, the, the mid to upper crust. Um, so can we see anything deeper? Um, the VS model um, is another, another data set um, that imaged this part of Australia. Um, and you can see that while we can, um, I can see some of the, the features that we see in the potential fields, um, it's actually dominated by kind of more of a northeast trend, at least to my eye, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, there's been some other passive seismic data which I haven't um, included in the presentation, um, some body wave tomography, um, but that has um, largely been dominated by um, signal from um, sort of Cenozoic events. Um, and a lot of the uh, features that we might expect from Paleozoic tectonics um, don't seem to be as well preserved. Um, so um, we're hoping that with EMT we can um, image some of these structures. Um, <clears throat> and so Auslamp in New South Wales um, is, uh, has, as I mentioned, um, New South Wales and Victoria has been um, collected as part of collaborative agreements with, um, with GA and both the Geological Survey of New South Wales and Geological Survey of Victoria. And so uh, there's 95 stations in Victoria um, and that's been complete and they're, they're released. Um, the New South Wales program isn't, um, is, is still ongoing, um, but we've released the 224 sites that have been completed so far. Um, there's some instruments out in the field at the moment. Um, we hope to be able to get out there uh, relatively soon to be able to continue the program. Uh, there's also um, some sites on the, on the western border of New South Wales collected by the University of Adelaide. So we've incorporated those in the model. And so the data I'm going to be showing you and the models I'm going to be showing you incorporate these sites. Um, so they were collected up until um, October last year. Um, and so I want to show you a few plots of the data. Um, one of the things that you can um, you can look at with MT data is the, an estimate of the signal penetration depth, and that kind of um, gives you an idea of um, how deep we can um, image using this data. Um, and you can see that that um, signal penetration depth is quite variable across the area. Um, so signal penetration is dependent on um, both the period um, that you record at, but also the resistivity of the of the lithos of the subsurface. Um, and so that resistivity is quite variable across the area, so you get quite a variation. Um, but what's what's good to note is that um, in most across most areas, we're imaging sort of more than uh, one in one to two hundred kilometres deep, which is enough to image uh, the entire lithosphere across most of the uh, area of interest. Um, so I'm going to show you a few uh, plots of the data itself. Um, and in each of these images I've kind of shown you, I'm showing you representative slices. Um, the left hand one, um, 64 seconds, which is approximately um, 
looking at uh, looking at the crust, the variations within the, the crust, top 40 kilometers, um, whereas the longer period ones on the on the right hand side is looking deeper into the into the mantle. Um, so induction vectors are, are the ratio of the vertical to horizontal magnetic field components. Um, and they tell you about um, lateral changes in resistivity. So in the way that I've um, plotted them here, they, uh, they will point to, uh, they tend to point towards conductors. Um, and you can overlay them on top of other geophysical data sets to see if we see any sort of correlation. And so I've overlaid them on the isostatic gravity map. And you can see that there are actually lots of areas where they correlate quite nicely. Um, so, um, for example, up in the northern part of the area, we've got some them pointing uh, pointing northwards. Um, down in, in southeastern Victoria, we have um, a positive anomaly down there that, that seems to be seen by the induction vectors. Um, also, in, in central to eastern New South Wales, I can see um, a bit of correlation. So, um, lots of interesting things going on in the MT data. Um, the other thing that you sort of notice is this kind of pin cushion effect and there's a couple of sort of small areas like in central uh, New South Wales, we seem to have this, this circular geometry um, similar to what we had in the potential fields. Um, at longer periods, um, you're obviously getting much more smoothly varying induction vectors reflecting the fact that we are sampling a larger volume. Um, and um, you can see some variations um, associated with, um, with, with variations in the, in the lithosphere, but um, they're actually dominated uh, to a large effect um, by the coast effect. So we've got um, the, um, especially in the south and the east, and they seem to be dominated by the coast. Um, the phase tensors. Um, so phase tensors are, um, Another way that we can look at the data, um, sort of two things I guess you can look at with phase tensors. The orientation um, is um, aligned with, uh, uh, roughly aligned with geo geoelectric strike. Um, the color of the phase tensors is also, um, can tells you about how resistivity changes with depth. So red colors mean that the um, resistivity is um, decreasing with depth or becoming more conductive. Um, and less than so the blue colors indicate that it's increasing with depth. Um, but what, um, what I've actually done is just focused on one of those attributes. So um, I'm gonna show you the phase tensor azimuth and overlay that on the magnetic map um, because there's, as you can see, there's quite a lot going on in this data set and um, putting, up, putting the azimuth up by itself actually helps you see trends a bit easier. Um, so you can see, um, you can see the um, there's a few trends that you can see in the data. So, um, for example, in northern Victoria, um, the sort of northwesterly alignment, um, and when you plot it on top of the magnetics, you can see that there's there's many areas that um, correlate well. So, for example, these north trending um, magnetic anomalies um, line up with the phase tensor azimuth quite nicely in in northeastern New South Wales. But there's also areas where we get sort of a contrast. So um, the phase tensor azimuth seems to be cross-cutting what we see in the in in Western um, New South Wales and Western Victoria, um, which may reflect the fact that the MT responses are sampling deeper in the um, in the lithosphere um, than the magnetic map, which tends to be dominated by the near surface. Um, but moving on to the model. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, we are incorporating uh, sites collected up until um, October 2019. So that's 193 new sites in New South Wales, uh, 10 sites on the border, those green sites on the border, um, and 95 in Victoria, so 298 sites, um, and a grid cell size of 7.5 by 7.5 kilometres. And for those who kind of are familiar with MT inversions, um, we've used a covariance of 0.6 and a reference model of 100 ohm meters. Um, and we were able to fit the data pretty well. Um, so a RMS misfit of um, 1.9 with error flaws of 5% of the diagonal um, components. 
off diagonal components. <clears throat> And so what I'll do now is I'm just going to um, step through the model and highlight some of the key interesting features that we've found at each level in the, in the model. Um, and so the first one I've shown is at two kilometres. Um, and in all of the images I'm going to show you, I've masked, um, point, masked model areas outside of 0.6 degrees of a station, um, which is roughly a station spacing. Uh, and in subsequent depth slices, I'm actually going to turn off the stations as well because they they become a bit distracting when we're overlaying lots of different data sets. Um, so um, I've shown them on the first slide so you know where they are. Um, but the interesting thing about the depth slice at two kilometres is that we actually um, unexpectedly um, resolved the sedimentary basins quite well. So these are the Mesozoic and Cenozoic sedimentary basins across the area. Um, and you'll remember back at the beginning, I said that our, our real target with Auslamp is the is sort of the lower mid to lower crust, but um, we're actually resolving the upper crust quite well. Um, we're resolving the, the extent of the sedimentary basins quite well, um, which is really interesting and really surprising. Um, at 10 kilometers, um, we've got a, um, a this is it's not all that interesting, I guess, from a geological perspective. Um, it's mostly resistive, um, but uh, it's quite reassuring from a model perspective because um, it suggests that a lot, um, a lot of the static um, shift effects in the MT data have been incorporated in the upper 10 kilometers. Um, I guess there's two kind of obvious exceptions to that. Um, the Kernamona conductor up in the Kernamona province, um, which um, Kate found as part of her PhD and is being investigated in more detail now with, um, with further work. Um, and there's also one in the Melbourne zone. So there could be, um, I guess, potential to look into that a bit more. Um, and firstly, to, to try and sort of better understand it and, and see how robust it is as well. Because um, there's you know, it's relatively small compared to the station spacing, um, so it'd be worth doing a lot more high resolution um, work over the top of it. Um, down into the mid, mid to lower crust though is where I think the model starts to get really interesting. Um, and so there's lots of different sort of conductors. I'm going to leave it, leave the slide on for a minute, minute so you can sort of have a look at the image. Um, but I'll point out some of the key features that we've sort of been looking at. Um, one of the most obvious ones of, is the, um, the conductor down here in um, central Victoria. Um, so we've got this kind of um, north north south strike sort of cross cut by an east uh, northeast sort of strike. Um, and I'll turn on the tilt filter magnetic map. Um, so you can see that that actually seems to um, sort of co correspond to where we get, like we start to get noisy bits in the, in the um, tilt filter image. Uh, up in the um, Dalamarian, this, this conductor up in the north is in the Dalamarian origin. Um, that one actually corresponds to a break in the magnetic anomalies. So if you have a look, um, you can see um, these strong magnetic anomalies coming up in, in Western New South Wales, and then there seems to be a break and then the conductor cuts right through it, which is really interesting. Um, we've got this curved conductor. Um, so that actually vertically connects to this, to this conductor here. Um, and um, this is the curved conductor comes around um, in, in uh, northern Victoria, and also sort of a, a north northerly alignment of anomalies along the east coast. The other thing that's interesting is these kind of transverse conductors. So they sort of almost um, they cross cut across the magnetic anomalies, but to my eye, they actually um, these transverse anomalies actually kind of the breaks in these anomalies seem to correspond to um, to um, anomalies in the um, tilt filter image or in the magnetic map. So lots of really interesting correlations that we can see um, between, the, between these two data sets. Um, I've overlaid um, some other features um, that have been found um, by, by various researchers. So um, the LTZ, uh, the Lachlan Transverse Zone, um, was a, a sort of a, um, a series of faults and, and structures that cross-cut the regional structural trend and um, 
I think that actually you can kind of see evidence for that in the MT. Um, the cell wind block. Um, so the, I, I mentioned um, the, the theory for the tectonic evolution of this area was the um, microcontinent collision into the eastern margin of Australia. Um, and the location or the estimated location of that seems to um, line up quite reasonably well with some conductors um, in the lower, mid, mid and lower crust. Um, and if you actually, so I've just put the seismic lines on here. So there's two deep crustal seismic lines that are of interest um, that cross this conductor, um, or just the northern tip of this conductor. And if you overlay the model on top of that, this conductor actually seems to be largely within the Salwin block or just on the margin of the Salwin block. So that kind of led us to think, well, maybe this is what the margin of the Salwin block looks like. Um, and so I'm just putting it out there. And if, um, if anyone has any thoughts on that, that'd be good to kind of to see. Um, just moving up a depth slice, I thought I'd just show you the, the depth slice at 20 kilometers with the, um, the VS model. Um, and I mean, to my eye anyway, I think I can see um, a bit of a, a bit of evidence for a northeast trend in the resistivity model, um, and that seemed there are some areas where that correlates with the VS model. So, for example, in um, southern and central Victoria, um, and also um, we get a bit of a northeast trend up in um, in the northeast part of the model, and that seems to be reflected in the um, in the VS model as well. Um, another thing we looked at was um, the correlation with um, mineral deposits and this work is the subject of ongoing work. I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail here, um, but if you're interested, keep, keep your eyes out. Um, but basically we noticed that um, we get a correlation with um, between conductors and mineral deposits. Um, and so I've just shown here gold deposits across um, New South Wales and in Victoria. Um, so we've got um, particularly some of the large um, copper porphyries aligning with um, some of these transverse structures that we've identified in the MT model. Um, also and probably related, um, we've got a, um, a correlation between alkaline um, mafic volcanism and, and conductors in the lower crust. Um, so are we mapping um, the metasomatized sort of lower um, crustal regions or, um, or, or conductive minerals that are deposited in the lower crust um, associated with some of these features. Um, okay, so um, moving now from the crust into the mantle and I'm just showing you a couple of sort of intermediate slides to transition because we actually see quite a change in the model as we move from the crust into the mantle. Um, and so here we've got a depth slice at 140 kilometers depth. And you see it's quite a different pattern that we see in the resistivity model at this depth. Um, so we're moving from, from this, these sorts of curved geometries to more of a northeasterly alignment. Um, and you may remember that if I, uh, I'm not sure if I pointed it out, but the, um, the phase tensors, um, phase tensor azimuth um, did show this alignment. So um, it's present in the data um, as well as in the model. Um, but I guess what we can't resolve for certain is um, whether these are actually discrete, discrete conductors or whether we're actually, um, what we've actually got is um, anisotropic resistivity um, that's aligned in a northeast direction. Um, but there's, um, some of these conductors correlate relatively um, well with some other, uh, some other data sets, so I'm going to show them now. Um, so we've got alkaline Cenozoic mafic vulcan uh, volcanics, um, which show a reasonable correlation with the conductors. Um, the Australian plate movement, so it's moving um, that vector um, and pointing out of um, the ACT that shows the direction of the Australian plate movement. Um, and that's similar alignment uh, to these, these conductors. Um, also, um, the Cosgrove volcanic track, um, uh, which was found to come down from, um, from Queensland down to Victoria, um, associated with the movement of, um, of the plate over a hotspot. 
uh, also seems to show some correlation with the conductors. Um, so the, um, the volcanic track was associated with, um, with intermediate um, lithospheric thickness, and it also seems to correlate with, these, um, with some of these conductors. Um, so are we um, potentially mapping the, the metasomatized source region of these volcanoes? Um, and the other interesting data set you can overlay is the, um, the LAB, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. Um, and so on the left, we've got the depth of the LAB um, and the 140 kilometer contour. And that's um, on the right, I've drawn the contour on the resistivity model. So that's essentially where the LAB intersects the resistivity model. Um, and you can see there's a good um, correspondence with these conductors with um, sort of variations in the lithosphere, um, the thickness of the lithosphere. So um, are these, some of these conductors associated with, um, with the entrainment of um, material um, associated with the movement of the Australian lithosphere over the, um, over the asthenosphere. Um, so uh, that's all I've got. Um, so I, just to summarize, um, I've finished up with uh, showing them um, the, our model over the top of the, um, the Legion's model um, across the whole of Australia. Um, and you can see the amount of detail, additional detail we're getting from, uh, the, from the OzLAMP data. Um, also of interest, I've shown some of the other models that GA has been involved in. Um, we've just released a Delamerian model and it seems to correlate um, really, really well. It seems to, to uh, match really well with our model. Um, and there's also one um, up in, in Northern Australia um, associated with the Exploring for the Future program. So that's um, Jing Ming's work. Uh, there are other models in progress across, um, across Australia. So um, the rest of South, most of the rest of South Australia has been modeled. Um, there's a model in Tasmania. Um, and it's models in progress, more models in progress in, in Northern Australia. Um, and they um, are demonstrating the power um, to resolve lithospheric architecture and identify these, these regions of, of interest. So I guess the next steps are to, um, to fill up the rest of the country, um, but also infill to try and understand some of these cut conductors in, the, in a lot more detail. Um, so I'll just finish up by um, acknowledging um, the, some of the partners that have been involved in, in OzLAMP and contributed to OzLAMP. Um, and I would especially like to highlight that we'd like to thank um, all of the people that have provided support um, to let us access the land, um, especially in remote, uh, rural and remote Australia, because without their support, we couldn't have done any of this work. Uh, and that's, that's it. I'll leave these links up and um, take questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alison. That was a really great talk and some awesome figures and results there. Um, uh, we'll just jump to the questions now. So this question was from Wenping. Uh, what is the depth range the long period data can map? Um, yeah, so we we've we showed that um, we plotted that out. Um, so um, anywhere from one to two hundred up to sort of well, in theory, six six or seven hundred. But we're sort of um, yeah, we're really looking at um, the upper sort of two or three hundred kilometers in the model. Um, and uh, she had another question as well. Can you see correlations between conductivity anomalies with stably or broken hill mining fields? Um, hmm. Yes. Let's have a look. Um, so I guess I've got to remember where broken hill actually is, but it's up where this conductor is, I think. Um, this one that comes across here, would I be right? Let me have a look at this. Sorry, I didn't see where you pointed. I was reading the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I mean, we can look at that in, in, in more detail. Um, and then up, um, this is in the Stavely region, this conductor down in um, in the southeastern Dalamarian. Um, 
So I'd have to probably overlay where, where exactly they are um, to see, but it looks like there are conductors in the general vicinity. Yeah. Uh, next question, Robert Hewson. Does your two kilometre resistivity slice that matches the basins in Vic SA in New South Wales uh, have a relationship with hydrogeology and deeper aquifers? Um, I don't. I don't know that we'll be able to get that much detail from Auslamp. Um, I think really, like the depth resolution, what we can see here, I guess, is um, that in the in the very upper two kilometres, we can see that it's kind of conductor. It's conductive in the sort of upper few kilometres, um, and the lateral extent seems to correspond to. Um, to where the sedimentary basins are. Um, but I don't know that we'd be able to get that amount of detail from Auslamp. Um, you'd probably have to do a more high resolution survey to be able to, to find that out. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but yeah. Um, Bob Musgrave, very nice talk. Alison, I'm wondering about the slight direction difference between the Australian plate absolute motion and the deep MT. Is it possible that this reflects some flow in the center sphere itself? Oh, uh, yeah, I, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, possibly. Um, I wondered if it's um, also re um, related. I'm going to turn to the relevant slide. Um, I also wondered if it's possibly related to like the interaction between differences in, um, in the, the lithosphere, the sinosphere boundary. So like um, irregularities in the boundary sort of interacting with that plate motion. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, it's quite possible, I guess. Yeah. Um, next question from Stefan Thiel. Uh, thanks for the talk, Alison, very informative. Having been involved with a few areas now across the country, um, why are the southern arrays showing strong resistivity contrast with very high and low resistivities, yet less so in the Northern Territory or SLAMP model? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting that that's the case. Um, I, I guess um, to be able to find out whether that's kind of a model thing or if it's a, if actual, like a real phenomenon, I guess you would probably want to model them both together in the same model. Um, so that would be really interesting to find out. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, yeah, there's sort of two components, like is, is this a real thing or is this a, a model, um, sort of a model thing that we're seeing or is it, um, or is it actually really like that? Um, so yeah. yeah. Stefan, I don't know either. <laughs> um, <laughs> neither do I. Um, Jared, uh, have you tested different starting resistivities? How does the model change with a different starting resistivity? Um, yeah, so I did a little bit of testing on the starting resistivities um, and yeah, like a um, higher starting resistivity makes it um, more resistive, the model in general. Um, so that's that's kind of expected, I guess. Um, but I did um, do quite a lot of work trying to get the best kind of value for starting resistivity as possible. Um, so um, we took uh, averages of the data um, so just like sort of geometric means over periods and, and stations um, and it all came out at around 100 ohm meters. I also did some um, 1D Occam inversions um, across the area and averaged those resistivities and that also came out at 100 ohm meters, around 100 ohm meters as well. So um, we're pr relatively confident that the level is quite good in this area um, and so that the starting resistivity is sort of a pretty good estimate of what it actually is. Yeah. Oh, um, and he has a follow-up question as well. Um, additionally, were statics considered before modelling? Statics. Um, no, we didn't do statics. We didn't do any static corrections. But um, I guess, like looking at the ten-kilometer depth slice, I was kind of reassured by that um, because a lot of the a lot of the very there's there's not much variation at all. Um, across most of it, although there's a couple of exceptions. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I don't think we really needed to, but um, yeah, open to suggestions, I guess. Um, questions keep coming. I hope you weren't looking forward to a break. Uh, Thomas, uh, great talk, Alison. I was wondering what the conductivity anomaly in the Selwyn block tells us about its composition. Um, okay, Selwyn block. Let's get this one out. Um, yeah, so you're talking about the one on the northern, north. I'm going to assume you're talking about the one on the northwestern margin of the Selwyn block. Um, I guess, I mean, there's not really much we can say other than that. It's a, you know, it's a, con it's a, some sort of conductive mineral. Um, I wonder if it's, um, it's to do with um, deformation along that margin. Um, so when you've got fractures and faults, um, that kind of tends to, and then if you've got a couple of, if you've got some conductive minerals, then they can um, become connected. And so that then you'll see a conductivity anomaly. Um, so in terms of exactly what it is, I'm not really sure. I guess, um, you know, the candidates are usually uh, sulfides, graphite, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I guess my guess would be as good as yours. <laughs> cool. Um, the next one, Wang et al's model shows a big conductor in northeast South Australia, which has disappeared in the recent model. Why? <laughs> Bet you'd like to know the answer to that question as well, Kate. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's not my model. No. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I noticed that as well when I was putting it up. Um, I guess that's something we're going to have to think about. This um, Delamarian model um, has only just come out, so we're sort of only just sort of starting to think about these questions. Um, Possibly, I guess it could be a smoothing effect. Um, so maybe the maybe the anomalies only up in in Queensland and Northern Territory, um, and it's kind of being smeared out a bit because of the low resolution of of Lejeune's model. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really know. I guess um, I guess also when we infill that whole gap between Northern and, and Southern, when we we do the modelling in that area, then that will help to find out more about that as well. Yeah. Um, Todd Majeski, are the mantle data patterns consistent deeper down? Uh, so the mantle deeper down. Um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think they go pretty deep, but um, I guess once I'm starting to get to 140 kilometres, I'm starting to get a bit nervous about showing things because I'm not so confident that they're they're real um, so 140 is getting quite deep um, but yeah I, I think from memory they are but I'd have to have a look at the data to confirm that. Um, Thomas uh, has another question when will the public be able to get their hands on these grids? Um, they're available. Yep. Um, the New South Wales the resistivity models there so you follow that link you can get them. Um, although re, although re northwest Selwyn block, lots of fractures and faults would lead to low S wave velocity, and the opposite was seen by Simon Pelia at twenty five kilometres. I think it was low S wave velocity, wasn't it? And I'm getting really confused. It could be the way I'm reading the question. Um, yeah, so it's low S wave velocity in the. Um, I, I was having a look at it too. Yeah, it, it was. Um, so we've got red as low as wave velocity um, on the plot. On the plot. So I think that works. Yeah. Cool. Uh, John Anderson, I know Stefan and Kate are looking at MT stations offshore South Australia. Does GA plan more in priority areas of underwater belt extensions slash connections such as Bass Strait and the Gulf? Um. Yeah, I don't really know. I guess um the the offshore stuff at the at the moment it's more about kind of just seeing how well it would work. Um and the once we get a better idea of how well it's gonna go, then definitely we can extend it out to those sorts of areas. Um 
but I wouldn't say we've got any fixed plans at the moment, but we, yeah. Yeah, could, I'm not, yeah. Maybe, maybe um, not. Okay, bear with me. There's lots of comments in the chat, so I'm just gonna work out. Uh, so, oh, uh, David Moore just had a comment that the northern margin of the Selwyn block has a sharp north dip. So, uh, your I think your interpretation checks out with the 40 kilometre east west east west conductor. Oh, that's good. Um, from Carol Chanota, uh, Alison, if we had a model of the thickness of Cenozoic sediments, uh, max thickness of about 600 metres in the Murray Basin, and we use it to set up the starting model for your inversion. Could this improve conductivity in the shallow parts of your model? Uh, he says this because you're now seeing the Murray Basin in the model at about two kilometres depth. Oh yeah, um, probably. I don't know that it would make much of a difference to the rest of the model though. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess two kilometres, like MT is well renowned for smearing down um, anomalies. So I, I think that's just what we're seeing here. Um, so yeah, it would probably um, help resolve the, the upper two kilometres, um, but I'm not sure that it would make much difference in terms of um, what we see at deeper depths. Yep, um, and Mark Duffett just had a comment to say that uh, yes, he did just read the velocity map wrong. Oh, cool. Wait, <laughs> so all good. Um, Janelle's question I think was the same as Stefan's, but I'll just read it in case uh, there seems to be quite a different character in model anomalies between the Northern Territory Queensland model and the ones in South Australia and New South Wales Vic at the same depth. Any thoughts on what's going on there? I think you've already addressed. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cool. Uh, lots of comments about it being well done. Excellent. Awesome. Clear. Nice work. Um, is the skin depth formula used to calculate the depth penetration? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Kevin Cassidy, thanks, Alison. Excellent progress in Auslan. Looking forward to seeing it move to the west. Um, lots of people looking forward to future models. Joe Kukaza, um, are the worms and blobs in the mantle real, i.e. discrete heterogeneities, or are they simply a function of resolution? I know it's difficult to answer definitively, but you can theoretically model resolution at that depth. And what would that tell you? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think I kind of touched on it. Um, yeah, those de those anomalies in the mantle, I mean, we do have ambiguity. They could be, um, you know, it could just be directional dependence. Um, it could be they're, they're smaller than what we see. Yeah, it could be a, a resolution thing as well. Um, I haven't done any modelling. I, I guess you probably could, um, but I guess I kind of often go by the rule of thumb that, you're roughly going to be able to resolve features roughly the similar size to um, the depth you're looking at. So these are sort of, uh, you know, of the order of um, 100 kilometres wide and we're at 140 kilometres depth. So we're probably at the limit of um, what we can resolve at that depth. Uh, Thomas Osterson, is there a spatial relationship between mid-crustal resistivity and granite batholiths in the Melbourne zone? Do you know? Oh, uh, yes. Um, hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, not, not off the top of my head. I don't know. I'd have to plot them up. Um, we, do, we do have, I do have a plot. Um, so the grey, and you can't see them very well, but the grey, um, the grey blobs here are the, um, the granites. Um, actually, there doesn't really seem to be a correlation um, to what I can see. So the Melbourne zone sort of in here. Um, they seem to cross, cross cut across them, um, but worth having a better look if you're interested. Yeah. Yep. Um, and last question by Anand Ray, um, uncertainty. <laughs> Mr. Mark. Is that what you will? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we haven't formally analysed uncertainty, but um, what we have done is a lot of different sensitivity tests. Um, so I ran a whole bunch of models um, with different smoothing parameters, um, different uh, starting models, different error flaws, and they're all in the supplementary information in our paper. So um, you can have a look at that. But in terms of actually like calculating uncertainties, we haven't done that. Um, he just added a comment. I meant in terms of difference of inversions. Yeah, <laughs> I think I answered that. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well, 
I think, I think you've answered more than your fair share of questions. <laughs> your question. um, and I'll tell you now that that was our biggest uh, webinar. You had the most people attend so far, so that's fantastic. We had wow. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, well done, um, and the comments all attest to that. So thank you very much for presenting, and thank you everyone for joining, um, and hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks. <laughs>